What's up, Cradle fans? Bamfius, Jarrett, whatever you want to call me. I'm here. I'm here to talk about Reaper. And I don't know if you watched the spoiler-free version. But this is the spoiler version where we talk about all the crazy shit that happens. All the progression, all the big reveals, all the theory. Well, not all the theories. Got to make content later. But I'll hint at some theories. I don't think I said this in the last one, but Reaper is one of my favorite books. I don't know if it's my favorite just because there are some things that happened in other books that just really I thought were great. Uh, the Athen is Osriel thing. I The very first video I ever made on this YouTube channel is about the shit I think about with Athen. And at that time, I was convinced that there was something super deep and intense related to Ethan, but I I didn't want to go so far as to say that he was Osriel because every other time I've read a story that had a something like that, it it just wasn't done very well. And everything that I've read in Cradle was executed pretty well. Extremely well in many cases. So when Ethan had all this weird shit going on with them. I'm like, okay, so maybe he has some sort of progress. Um, what was it? Like, I thought that he had some similar thing going on, like Shah Miara had, where there was some sort of royal way to pass down power. The Aurelius family's been around forever. The Shah family's been around forever. Blah, blah, blah. Or that Athan had the remnant of Tiberian somewhere and was like using, I don't know. I don't know. It, it really makes you wonder, right? Like the whole series now has even more reread value because you can go and reread every single thing that Ethan has ever said. You can now take from the context of this is Osriel. So a couple scenes that really stick out to me and before I even like get into this, um, in a second, I'm going to show like what the book flow was, like what I remember the book flow being. Uh, and then we can like, I'm just going to talk about each section. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is thinking back on previous books, how Ethan said things. The one that keeps getting called out that everyone thinks is hilarious and it is, but, you know, it's whatever, is when he's talking with Naru Wan after he kills Jai, Jai Desho. And the, the Emperor's like, do you need me to show you how to kill someone? And Ethan's like, bro, believe me, believe me, this doesn't happen often. I subconsciously or like internally am the actual angel of death. I'm the angel of death. I took a holiday, a 200 year holiday, and I'm just trying to find some friends. Okay, bro. Okay. And I mean, it's funny in many ways, right? Because Ethan comes back. He decides to take on a non destructive path. He decides to try and find friends that can keep up with him. He decides to not be who he was to effectively when you've gone so far and you are set in stone as a certain like the universe recognizes you as the avatar of death and you don't want to be the avatar of death how do you change that how do you fix that how do you take any holidays well, he figured out how to do that. And we could get into the moral implications of like the angel of death taking a holiday and leaving the rest of the Abaddon to fight the, like the demons in the dark. But I mean, they existed without the Reaper for a very long time. And Daruman was their own screw up. Machiel couldn't decide he didn't want to devote the resources to it. So I... There's gray, it's just so many gray areas here. And every single person that ascends is like an, a very competent person. 
And Suriel's presence in Reaper calls out the fact that they rarely work in teams. So, like, when you're the angel of death, nobody wants to work with you. Everybody wants to use you. They're, they're, le they're like, advancing their own agendas through you. You find a way to, like, start over. So Ethan goes, he goes home. He uses the, uh, the origin shroud to remake his, who he is as a person. And here's the crazy part. The origin shroud was so powerful that it allowed him to completely start fresh without being under the influence of the Eldari pact. It allowed him to have a completely new set of like, like a completely new Madra system. He had to lock away, obviously, a lot of who he was because like a mortal body can't contain like the mental capacity of a judge. More or less, like no less the mental capacity of like a high ranking Abaddon. He obviously couldn't bring his weapons. He couldn't bring his armor. He couldn't bring his mantle. He had to lock away his authority. And even then he was, he was stellar. I just... The book executed this so well that I loved it. There's some things that I wish were different. And it, it wasn't necessarily that I wish that Ethan wasn't Osriel. It's more that I wish we got more of a tangible, universal resonance with the fact that he had been able to change himself, who he is at his core, before reverting to being Osriel. Otherwise, he just wasted the best opportunity ever to rewrite who he is so that he doesn't have to be stuck in that mold. So, we'll get into that at the end of this video. I'm going to share my screen now. And we're just going to go from there. Okay, you can see my screen now. My face got small. Life is fine. This was the book flow as I saw it. There's two. There's basically two different stories. There's the Abaddon story. Oh, I gotta add one more thing here. All right, there we go. Now we have the complete tale from both from both sides, and it goes something like this: Elder Whisper is lame. In the beginning of the book. Lyndon is flying back with Elder Whisper, and I cannot tell you how much I, I mean, I can tell you how much I hyped up Elder Whisper because I've documented and chronicled it on this channel. I thought Elder Whisper was the coolest thing ever. I thought he was mysterious and just awesome, and I really hope we can get some sort of definitive, like, who the f is this fox why was he left there why did he choose to guard the labyrinth somebody why like one person could do this will please answer this question you have no reason to if you don't want to but i would just personally really appreciate it if you just like went into like why elder whisper sacrificed so much of his life to just chill inside sacred valley because, like, I'm slowly starting to hate hate him as a character. And I don't know. Like, it's taken me multiple reads of this book to get to that point. Anyway, I guess he doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but he's so lame. So the beginning of the book, they bring the fox. The fox tries to tell them about the secrets of the universe. And... Everybody can see through his illusions. And I just, it's sad, man. It's sad. So, getting over that, we've got our Overlord Sage. We've got our Overlord Herald. We have our Arch Lord ish, Arch Lord ish Zeal. We've got our Under Lady. Mercy, which I didn't even put that in here, but I'll have to talk about that. Our under lady Mercy, who <laughs> faked all of you for a whole book, me included, that Mercy was actually an overlady. 
she's not. She's an underlady still. She just has a super powerful sacred instrument that lets her play pretend. So she was playing pretend against a dread god and got smacked down and then got trapped inside of her super special book. So Lyndon goes in, being his sage self, and he pulls her out of there. I love that. That's super cool. I did think it was a little bit interesting how he was just able to figure out that out. But he's a sage now, and he's had some practice with using his authority. And I don't really think, like, the book wanted Mercy in there. It was just a circumstance of what happened. Because as soon as he pulls her her spirit out of there, her Madra channels relax. The book starts to re, like rejuvenate. It was like this weird cycle both the book and her spirit were in. So I'm not going to, like get into that too much because that's fine you know it's they they play in a, a world of magic and Lyndon has some special reality warping magical powers that he used to save his friend but i love how this twin star sect is starting to shape up because it's exactly how you had hoped it would play out where athan he just acts like Ethan and sets up this sect and promises people the world if they'll come and, you know, play sacred artists with him. And I love that Jai Chen is in there. And I love, I just, I loved it. I love that Lyndon's like, what the hell? What the hell, Ethan? And Ethan's like, I was going to ask you. And then Lyndon's like, fair point. I actually love this idea. This is awesome. Thank you. Ethan's like you're such a beautiful you're such a beautiful soul I'm so happy to have given up all my power and authority to come and, and make friends with you so I love that Sect of Twin Stars super cool super cool in the in the previous video that I made the spoiler free one I talked about the release schedule for the books and what book 12 the makeup of book 12 and okay it's a proposed release schedule no one knows what the release schedule is but Will on his release stream gave some some concepts, some thoughts. Well, book twelve is going to be a, a behemoth potentially with lots of epilogue and exposition, and I hope that the sect of twin stars gets like its own epilogue chapter because it's really shaping itself up to be something special. Uh, after they go to the Black Flame Empire, which I realize, uh, actually, I have a bullet point here: sect founding and students. So I'll talk about this then. Uh, Sect of Twin Stars, love it. Uh, then we have our famous Black Flame Empire shows up scene. And I can say it's famous because it was the pre-released section. It was the part that Travis read at Dragon Con. It was the part that we all got to listen to and read over and over again to like satiate our never-ending appetite uh, while we waited for Reaper to come out. And so that scene's cool in, in many ways. Not, not that specific scene, but like the sequence of events that leads up to it where Lyndon thinks that, like we find out one, that Lyndon is able to help his parents like fix their path, fix their iron bodies, fix their techniques in preparation because Kelsa does that with Orthos. And we find out that he's able to do that with his parents, but his dad is still being, you know, dick face mcgee and doesn't trust his son for anything eventually i mean this is just classic like my worldview is a certain kind of way and when i am repeatedly introduced with evidence that my worldview is completely wrong my worldview is the only thing i have to hold on to it's the only thing that defines me as a person so i just hold on to it for dear life and everybody else around me slowly just gets fed up with me that's like classic Jaron, way she Jaron, and i feel bad for him but he gets basically a free pass to gold and he gets new eyes and his leg is fixed and all this stuff so it, it really puts into perspective again how far Lyndon has come where he finds a pill that is terrible and defunct but it's able to take someone straight to Jade. An area of advancement that his family had only dreamt of. 
that I mean, it's just we've come so far in like four years. All right, so the Black Flame Empire shows up. We've got the the Emperor kicking Athan. Um, we've got the display of effects, all that good stuff. And then we we get to the point where we're returning to the Black Flame Empire, and we get to ex see some interesting stuff where Linden spars with the Emperor, and we get to see that yeah, our our Emperor knows what he's doing. He's a great fighter. He's just an emperor and a diplomat, and he wants to take care of his people. Advancement, now that he's an overlord, was not a priority. But now there's people that are a part of the empire that are much stronger than him. So progression, I believe, now becomes something he can focus on again. So he's talking with Athan and Linden about how to get to Arch Lord, Arch Lord. And he's a good fighter. I there's a lot of cool stuff that happens when they're they're traveling back and if, if I don't call something out I'm going straight from memory I've read the book multiple times but th this is the way that this part of the book felt it was like you had your fist clenched for so long and you finally get to relax it so like the the anxiety that was bloodline gets to bleed away and we get to finally relax and revel in the strength of our, our favorite characters in this part of the book. And I loved it. And it's the slice of life stuff, sort of, that we've been, many of us have been hoping to see parts of and didn't necessarily expect to get based on the pacing of the books. So loved that. Want to see more of that. Hope to see some short stories around that or something. And I think that was hinted at in the release stream. Will mentioned that he was going to do some more slice of life esque stories of of their time in the in you know Serpent's Grave and Black Flame and the Black Flame Empire. Uh, but it, this was cool, and we got to see how Ethan jumping from boat to boat, being his you know self, and he never shared. Uh, a cloud ship with uh, Naru Gwe because obviously Gwe hates him and now can't do anything to him. Uh, Gwe probably refuses to show him any respect, so he just avoids him at all cost. So Athan is cleaning up the ships, being his funny self. We get to see all sorts of fun stuff. But then we get back to the Empire, we get back to Serpent's Grave, and we continue with the founding of the sect of twin stars. We see that the Aurelius family has completely taken over Serpent's Grave. Um, the petty problems that they have are easily solved by just having the powerful sacred artist walk down the street. So Yaren walks down the street of a neighboring town and suddenly all of the avenues the Aurelius family was looking to advance upon are open to them. and. You just love to see it, right? It's like this relaxing time of the book. And we see Lyndon teaching students how to cycle uh, the Path of Twin Stars or what, like whatever it's called, that cycling technique that lets you uh, pull apart your core. So we're going to see a ton of students running around with multiple cores, which I find fascinating. I anticipate the core wars not coming back but at least people talking about how hey now we might have a couple of of lower like you know not important main characters trying out the splitting of the core multiple multiple times we learn that a lot of their cores have been purified so they're allowed that they're, they're starting back with with pure cores and they are focusing on splitting their cores now. I thought that was that was wild. We had a funny interest a funny slash interesting point in the book where Ethan is talking with Cassius. And I'm slowing down my talking because after you've read Reaper and you read it again, this part is funny and interesting and a little bit sad where Cassius notices that Ethan is finally 
happy. He's content. And then classic trope, but not a trope. Ethan says, finally, everything is, he was going to say perfect. And then he claps his hand on his mouth. He's like, man, I was about to say everything's perfect. Do you know how terrible that would have been? Incoming stress. So yeah, then we see that Ethan starts to freak out because he senses what's happening with the labyrinth in some kind of way. The way that Ethan, first of all, Ethan can't say, hey, I have a connection with the labyrinth. Uh, I, I owned the labyrinth for a long period of time. And my I have like an authoritative connection with that place. Obviously, he can't say that or he breaks whatever agreement slash purpose he had with the the origin shroud and so he just kind of gets a little abstract with it for a little while and then Ethan pushes him on it and he's like well it could be fate and he uses his connection with the oracle icon to showcase that I might have a little bit of a connection with the ability to sometimes sense fate and so it's enough to get Lyndon and Yaren well, mainly him and Lyndon, to go check it out. We see Rhaegon Shen doing all his stuff. I actually really liked that part where Rhaegon Shen is going into the labyrinth. He's running around the labyrinth. He's having to, like, spend priceless treasures to accomplish what he's trying to do. And I found it fascinating that the script powering the suppression field was powered by the dread gods anchors uh, the anchors to their existence i've called that shit out for many books several books once we started learning about the uh, existence i think it was either in underlord or uncrowned yeah existence is a concept that that's probably what was keeping them alive is that their existence was anchored somewhere as the books progressed and we saw more instances of existence uh the more certain i became that yeah they're, they're tied to the labyrinth and their existences are anchored there somewhere once upon a time someone asked will if if like liches were possible the dread gods are effectively liches. Their phylactery, the like essence of their life, is stored inside the labyrinth. Now they're not exactly like liches, because I think if you destroy the phylactery, you kill a lich in like Elder Scrolls lore or other lore. But the dread gods don't die if you destroy their. Ooh, I was almost yawn. The dread gods don't die if you destroy their anchors to existence. You just make them killable. You make their existences exist within themselves. They're not being shielded by anything anymore. And the end of the book, there's a lot of implications to how the end of the book, what like what ends up happening because there's a certain character that now owns the place that houses those anchors of existence. And imagine if it had ended differently with a certain other character having control of the labyrinth the dread gods would never have been killable because you wouldn't have been able to get into the labyrinth to stop it ever in any way so uneasy Athen uh, leads to the return to sacred valley after Rhaegon Shen switches up the dread god cores putting them back into their original locations and we now have a problem. Hunger Aura is gushing out into the world. It's being kept in Sacred Valley, but still. And so now we have to go on a D&D campaign, obviously. It's a dungeon dive now. So we need to assemble our D&D team because the Wizards of Orlando from Castle White have released a new player's handbook. D&D the Western Labyrinth. So we, we assemble our team. We've got Lyndon. We've got Ethan. We've got Zeal. We've got Mercy. We've got Yaren, of course. And we also have Orthos. In baby turtle form. 
Baby Turtle Orthos is awesome. In fact, I have a poster somewhere of of Orthos that Sam sent me for something I did that was helpful to him. You know, I'm going to pause this video and go get it. So in three, two, I'm going to show it to you in three, two, <gasps> baby Orthos, the dragon advances into a small form. Yeah, I was trying to like flatten it out because it's like all, it didn't, it didn't ship well, but it's way better than it was before. So I'll get that flattened out and hang it up somewhere. Thank you, Sam. Samuel, Samuel White. All right, where were we? Uh, oh yes, our D and D campaign with Baby Orthos and Little Blue. Oh, I forgot to talk about Little Blue. She's awesome. She can uh, smack jades around and probably low golds. If she's smacking jades around that hard that easily, she can probably fight golds, which is awesome. And the fact that she was able to, spoiler alert, survive in the labyrinth for the most part, at least in the beginning. Oh wait, I didn't show the Orthos as a big picture. So I'll do that right now. There we go. Whoops. The dragon advances. I don't know if you can purchase these posters, but that would be cool if you could. That's upside down. Woo. So, so nice. So that's a product idea, white family. Just saying. At minute 26. Holy shit, I need to hurry this up. We're not even halfway through. We still have the dungeon dive ahead of us. All right, so a couple of super big points about the about our dungeon dive into the Western Labyrinth. One, the Labyrinth is a spatially charged place. So the ability to manipulate space is inherent into the structure, and the structure spans the entire planet. That's important for later, okay? Um, we learned that the original Court of Seven built it. That's interesting, and there's a lot to be said about that because when they were around the Eladari pact wasn't signed so they didn't have to stay away from cradle that's probably why they built it cradle was the original home base of the abaddon pre Eladari pact you heard it here first literally you heard it here first so that's cool love that a lot you learned we learned about that then we learned that osriel after the original court of seven osriel lived there. Osriel toiled away there. That was his home, which makes sense considering how powerful he was. Oh man, all the Osriel stuff we learned throughout this book. Those were cool. What a badass. I mean, an asshole, an arrogant asshole, but a badass nonetheless. So the labyrinth, the whole labyrinth experience was fun because the it wasn't just like sacred artists going into a place and doing their thing. It was sacred artists going to one of the da most dangerous places and trying to do their thing while constantly having obstacles thrown in their path, having to like the logistics. Thank goodness. Lyndon is obsessed with like bringing stuff and like always being prepared. I can't even imagine. Like there are literally parts of this book where the other characters are like, it's fine. Lyndon's got all the stuff we need and yeah he's the reason why the groups are so like succeeded at all uh, in terms of being able to replenish their madra being able to replenish their soul fire uh, being able to have enough natural treasures so that mercy is able to advance when she goes to her part spoiler alert uh, that's coming up I also the soul soul smithing got way cooler in this book way cooler because soul smithing at a basic level is one thing and it was cool and i made a soul smithing video about it which is completely outdated now but there's a soul smithing at the lord level and at the monarch level and up ab and above like god soul smithing is cool and it it's interesting in that if you want to create a significant item you need to create it in an area that resonates with the kind of significance that you want. For example, 
when Osriel builds the scythe, where does he go to build the scythe? Osriel goes to the deepest depths of the void, so far away that nothing else can survive. Everything is destroyed at that deepness of the void. Fiends can't survive there. Humanity can't survive there. But a super high-ranking Abaddon, being his, having such high authority of destruction that he can survive that deep into the void to forge an object of perfect destruction. That is awesome. And it makes sense. And it's cool the, 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 the difficulty with which someone has to operate to create something so powerful. Like you, you have to have the perfect environment for it. And having the Soul Forge mimic that to a degree, I think is ingenious. Again, that's why it was made that way. It's like a cheat code. And Ethan used it to help with the zeal, and then we get to see Lyndon use it. And that was awesome. And, uh, the Void. The Void and Order. Two sides of this yin and yang situation. Which is also commonly talked about as like the cycle of creation. Like creation or life is a cycle something is born it lives it dies its resources are recycled to the environment to give birth to something new which is what the whole point of the Eladari pact is is to allow the fate of an iteration to progress from life until death an entire division is the ghosts are built around helping fragments of a dead iteration come together with other fragments to create something new but it is not pure creation it is not something that comes from nothing when Lyndon made his hammer he sensed that he was pulling something from nothing and it resonated with his void icon That is significant for something that's later in the in the books. I guarantee it. I, I'm pretty sure many of you picked up on that. But it matters a lot. The Soul Forge is... It's insane. And the fact that Lyndon can't even like comprehend the power of like the symbols on the stones... I wonder if he can now that he's a full sage. That he, he's a full Archlord Sage. Archlord Sage. Oh my gosh. I'm just going to say Ark Lord from now on. I don't care. I don't care, Travis. You don't You don't watch these, but I don't care. Arch, Ark Lord. Damn it. Ark Lord. Wow. All right. So uh, I thought that the Herald level Dread God was cool because it allowed them to get powerful bindings. It allowed them to learn more about how the Dread Gods operate. It allowed Linden to learn more about advanced bindings. One binding that can hold multiple techniques. I think that's super important for later on, uh, especially for his understanding of reality. But also the fact that he, I'm kind of going all over the place here, but the fact that when he made his hammer in the soul forge, the hammer gives off this extremely intense, heavy feeling of creation, pure creation. Like he just has to use that thing to make something cool. Like, I don't know. Eight man empire armor, but like four man empire armor, which I mean, I, we're, we're kind of, we're kind of seeing the foreshadowing, right? I'm just going to jump in here for a second and throw some theories. Uh, Mercy. Actually, I don't know who the other Herald is going to be, but we've got Yaren as a full Herald. We've got Linden as a sage and we've got zeal as a, as a potential sage. We need one more Herald and we might be able to make a four man empire. And I think like the forging of some sort of armor like that, that will protect their existence so that they can go fight dread gods or they might hit monarch. I don't know. But the, the forging of that armor might 
allow for Linden to manifest the hammer icon or the, the creation icon, the builder icon. That could be his next icon. Love that. Love that. We, I don't know, we also saw like Yaren protecting the team and both she and Ruby or she, her knowing that Ruby would love that they were able to protect the people. I mean, she's, she's so tight and she doesn't even know. She doesn't even know. Uh, let's see. The, the fight with Reagan Shen when all of them fought and like how critical was Linden to that whole affair? So critical. So critical. I mean, Ethan was too. But like even Yaren was like dead. Like she was done. Done so. And Raygon Shen failing to like. I mean, the, yeah, of course he sends like the worst possible weapon at Linden. That like uh, dream sword that, that Dross had to fight with. But I mean, oh God. The fight. So Will Bright's fight scenes extremely well. And this book had a ton of them. And that that's one of the things that really made this book like so much fun so much fun i mean what else Ethan getting stopped dead in his tracks in the in the room of penance i thought that was great i mean at this point most uh, many of us were like damn he's he's so osreal it's not even funny it's not even funny but even then like could he really be and we like just like doubt ourselves so much I doubted myself. I'm like, come on. There's so much foreshadowing that he's Osriel that it feels like like an intentional red herring. Like we're intentionally being led down this wrong path for something else, uh, which is one of the ways that I thought it was executed so well, right? That we we saw it coming, but we still didn't believe it. And then when it came, it was, oh, it was so cool. So cool. But again... There was a part of that, of Osriel, of Ethan, hoping to rebuild himself that maybe he did. I don't know. I thought the fact that he was trying to get the joy icon, that was so perfect. I know Yaren rolled her eyes, but come on. Like, that's perfect. I actually thought while I was reading the book when he like hugs all his friends at the end that he would have manifested the joy icon. Like I thought that's how his character arc as Ethan on cradle was going to end. Is that him manifesting the joy icon? I mean, at that point it doesn't even matter, you know, he's, he's, but it would, it would be the universe recognizing. I don't know. It would have been hard to work in to the book, I think, but I really think that we'll see something like that. Not something like that, because I don't know if it even can happen. In it, but Ethan is no longer Osmanthus. That's clear. His character growth has come a long way. Now that he's rebound by the Eladari Pact, I mean, that's something, but he mentioned that he had lost some of who he was due to the origin shroud. So maybe there's room for him to, he's still the pure personification of destruction. That won't ever change, but maybe he, like there's just, there's some room. He's not completely locked in anymore. He, he was able to grow. And there's some room left for him to continue growing, perhaps. Perhaps. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, the, the Labyrinth. The, the Osreel's legacy. Did anyone else, like, comment below if, if you thought there's no way Linden's getting this legacy? Like, that is, like, such a juicy carrot being held in front of us. It's like, it's like slide of hand almost. Like, ooh, look at this juicy legacy. Don't pay attention to the fact that your friend, you know, is the one that left it for you and whatever. Yeah, I I didn't think he was there was any chance in hell of him getting that legacy. But I was still sad when he didn't get it. Ah. Uh, I thought that the 
Lyndon's insight into helping Mercy advance was extremely uh, smart. Kind of came out of nowhere, but, you know, Lyndon's a smart dude at this point. He's had uh, a very powerful mind spirit in his head for a long time. And he, he's the kind of guy who always finds a way to get it done. And he really wanted his friends there. So advancing her made the most sense. And she, even she, she knows how to do it. So I thought that was really well. I thought that was cool. And made sense. It was executed. It was executed well. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. All right, let's move on. Uh, the second fight with Reagan Shen. Uh, well, I won't get there yet. But I don't know. I also thought it was interesting how like they want to be a team, but like one by one, the team members were like. This is as far as we can go. We can't help you anymore. And and like the closer they got to the slumbering wraith, it was like, I got to tap out. I'm sorry. I can't go anymore. And the fact that it was Ethan and Lyndon at the end felt like foreshadowing to me. Osriel, the pure avatar of destruction, and Lyndon the potential pure avatar of creation being friends and walking that path to the end and oh man what what how messed up was it for the labyrinth to throw osriel at them in in hunger form and for i mean clearly Ethan was the trump card for that but man and how about linden's Arc Lord revelation when he's fighting Ragon Shen. The fact that he's able to fight Ragon Shen at all, even after the Slumbering Wraith had died, that was so cool. That was so cool. And that's what this bullet point here, the Lion, the Wraith, and the and the Void Sage. That uh that, that moment was cool. And I haven't even gotten to the whole Jai Long finally getting to Underlord, or I haven't talked about the Jai Long and Kelso romance. There's too much to talk about. I'm at 42 minutes. If you've watched this far, you're an addict and you need to, you need to get help. <laughs> you need to get help. Stop watching my videos and get some help. I haven't talked about the Abaddon storyline either. But I thought Lyndon's final revelation was so perfect. It wasn't just I will never stop. It's we will never stop. We will never stop. And that is perfect because Lyndon's no longer, he's never, he's, Lyndon has never been someone that can operate alone. Even in Ghostwater, he built a presence so that he wouldn't have to do it, it alone. He is the perfect counterpoint to what Ethan wanted. He, he, it's great. I love it. And then finally, King in the Castle, King in the Castle. Linden advances to Ark Lord, fights with Reagan Shen, realizes he's going to lose, and then uses the authority of the Labyrinth to kick that mofo out. Also, I just want to call this out, but Reagan Shen was like the most cat of all cats in this book. He's like playing with his food playing with his prey, always messing with you at the wrong times. In the last video, my cat Miko like jumps onto the table and is like all in my business and goes up on the shelves and stuff. The most cat of all cats. And even at the end when he like realizes how much he screwed up, he's like freaking out. Like I got to get rid of them. ASAP. Like, I feel like if, if a cat had real humanized thoughts, that's like a very common thing for mess... Like someone comes over your, to your house and they're playing with your cat and your cat's like, I'm going to get you. And then the person's like, you're so cute. And the cat's like, oh, no. Then they leave. It's like, whew, made that person ascend from this house. I did great. Now I can go back to ruling over my my territory. Such a cat. Yeah, that, that was that was cool. But then when Lyndon kicked him out. And then the the way that he was able to get authority from each of the levels 
you know, like first the hunger where he had already made a deal with a, with a wraith and hunger was a core part of who he was. And that like, that was great. Then the Solstmas, well, he had created a hammer that was like the personific. It was almost like he, he like literally manifested the hammer icon without manifesting the hammer icon. He like created the hammer and it felt like an icon of pure creation. It just didn't somehow manifest the actual hammer icon, but like it was an icon of creation. And so the, obviously the soul Smiths were like, for sure, bro, that's awesome. Have at it. And then the Osriel one, while well, we still didn't realize that Osriel was Ethan, but at this point it's like, Ethan is enough of Osriel that your connection with him makes it so Osriel would love you. Osriel's like, sure, bro, you deserve this place. And then finally, we have the original Court of Seven. And I loved that their authority was still there and still so strong. And that little marble that Suriel gives him at the very beginning of the series is like his key to that castle. He is now the sole owner of the labyrinth. He is now the owner of a global network of spatial manipulation and advanced technology that happens to house the four anchors of existence of like the thing that everybody wants to get rid of so if we have like Lyndon being like all right SWAT team let's go teleport anywhere in the world easily oh shit Ragon Chen's coming with all of his sages and stuff and we can't fight them right now because we're not ready the armor's not complete teleport away Ooh, let's go corner this herald and try out our armor. Pff, teleport to the herald. Take him out. Teleport. Okay. They basically have access to like cradles, you know, the best cradle infrastructure. And they can get, they can escape the dread gods pretty easily now. If they have access to the uh, an entrance to the labyrinth. But I mean the fact that like our team now has a safe home base that the uh, the monarchs can't really jack with gives them some leverage i thought that was cool love that and then of course the final eighth and surprise where ooh, if we come over to the abaddon side it's basically been the judges being their independent asshole selves serial playing high stakes poker and none of the judges could afford to call her bluff because it, it like literally wasn't a bluff so they showed up to help her that scene where the judges lay the smack down on all the brochure was was so well done and orchestrated and the personalities of the different abaddon were so cool uh, durandiel being a personal favorite of mine just because she's just like i don't care oh look you're manipulating time pretty cool I like that. I'm going to put you in my little box and like take you away and let you re-educate you on the virtues of our, you know, Abaddon order. It was so creepy, but also so like such a boss move. And then of course, Daruman escapes the cradle. We have all the different perspectives of a destroyer has come. Everybody's freaking out. All the fate has been sealed. Space has been sealed. Your futures are sealed. You're all going to die. To the point where, like, the stars winking out. Like, that was... That was... Chapter 24. Chapter 24 is intense. And it's, like, just the sequencing of events just to, like, hype up the terror. <laughs> and then Ethan, like, oh, shit. Playtime's over, folks. My time has come. And then, of course, his marble. He had repurposed it so many times throughout the book that why wouldn't he have repurposed that marble to be like the, you know, like the key to unlocking, like the marble was effectively his seal. Uh, and like the cracked marble on the cover signifies him giving up his 
life as as Athan to take back up the mantle of Osriel to one protect his friends. Would Osriel have cared had he not gone through that experience and made such close friendships? Like he probably would have fought Daruman regardless because how dare Daruman? But I don't know. Also, like the line where it's like, "How could you know?" And he's like, "I always know," but he didn't know. That was great. Classic Ethan. And then, of course, the fight with Daruman. We see truly like the potency of authority because Osriel is the pure authority over destruction and the scythe is like the weapon of destruction that he was able to just take the weapon and then just beat Daruman senseless with it. I mean, I th also thought it was cool that he was able to just like stop the, uh, like the dark attack, which in a sense kind of reminds me a little bit. This is a spoiler of elder empire which I personally don't think is an actual spoiler because it's been out for so long, but so many of you haven't read it. This is why I'm not in Discord for a little while because I'm just like sick of all the, I don't know. Anyway, there was a cool parallel between him stopping that like black knife edge and then Urgnot launching his attack at Calder and Calder using the authority of the Emperor based off Abaddon armor to stop it. Um, you know, and having already, I think at that point he'd already spoken with Osriel. I just, it was like a cool parallel there. Because Ergonaut was like the chaos, like the chaos fiend, class one chaos fiend of like hunger. It wanted to devour everything. It wanted to be the end of, of everything. There's just some cool parallels there that I was reminded of. And then Ethan just like beating the crap out of Daruman, making him run away. And then like unmaking Machiel's mistake. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, because like no. At this point, I don't find any of the judges to be like innocent or good completely. Serial might have be an exception because she's like actually willing to work with other people and she's actually willing to like try to do good and like listen to other points of view and not be so like stuck in in like ancient ways but like man Machiel is like so rigid and like let his personal grudge against Osriel lead him to trying to like recreate the scythe even if he had like good intentions you know Gadriel being like unable to make decisions properly so he relies on Machiel to like tell him where to go uh, Durandiel like not being willing to help others same thing was like Sicario just going out trying to steal all the important stuff Razael just wanting to go out and fight all the time. Like, I don't know. They're all, they're all flawed, which is interesting. They're, they're supposed to be the pinnacle of, of existence. And yet they're so flawed. Yeah. It, it, it's just, it's an interesting dynamic that I like a lot. We're at 53 minutes. All right. So looking forward to book 11 to dread God. I found it interesting that that book title is Dread God and not Dread Gods, meaning it's probably going to revolve around, I mean, Ragon Shen. The, I can't even fathom what the cover is going to be because we already have a badge with the four Dread Gods on it in Bloodline. What's the cover going to be for, for Dread God? I don't know. Maybe we get the history of the uh, slumbering wraith as Ragon Shen attempts to become the new one either way i love the book um some of the concepts in it were clearly very difficult to execute and will did an exceptional job many folks many like high profile folks in the discord 
have mentioned that it's hard to dislike what happened because of how well it was executed and i didn't hate it to begin with but it again executed extremely well great book still processing tons of theories tons of theories there's so much going on i mean we're kind of getting we're kind of running out of like what's going to happen in the next books there's only two books left but there's so much that's going to happen in those two books that I don't, I don't feel too bad about it. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Uh, thanks for sticking with me for almost an hour. I hope it helped fill your own void of, uh, of you know, with lacking creative content. Let me know if you just absolutely hate that I dropped two videos in a day. I just... I don't know. I didn't want to make y'all wait. Even if it it like takes away from my views or whatever. I mean, I can't monetize my YouTube channel anyway. I've talked about that in the in the podcast. So, I do this just as like a recreational thing. There's there's no financial incentive in this for me at all. Um, it's all out of out of just the passion that I have for the series. And honestly, uh, to connect with other people passionate about this random book series that in the beginning I didn't even want to read because I didn't like the covers or something. I can't remember. Like I've told this story on the podcast before, but I, I in the beginning didn't even want to, I, I just couldn't be bothered to read Cradle until I sat next to Will, realized who he was, chatted with him and then afterwards i was like that guy's so nice i should probably read all his books at the time i think black flame had like just come out maybe or was about to come out yeah i know that the, the when i started reading the books only the first three were out uh those books i had read traveler's gate a long long time before that so thanks for watching Thank you for liking Cradle as much as me, that you're willing to go 57 minutes and do a video on Cradle. Let me know in the comments what kind of theories you have or what theories you would like addressed, concepts you'd like question, like answered, things like that. Give me some, I have some uh, plenty of ideas for future videos, but give me some of your own. Thanks for watching again as I try to figure out how to end the video. Goodbye.